welcome. Um, this afternoon, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Spencer Crew, Interim Director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and Professor Clay Carson, uh, the Director of the Malcolm the King Papers, and Professor Emeritus at Stanford, MLK Junior Professor Emeritus at Stanford. Welcome, Bo. Great to have you. Good to see you. Glad to be here. Um, great. So I, I wanted to start um, by thinking about what's going on in the country right now. In particular, we just had an election, or maybe we're still having an election. I'm not sure which it is. Um, but we presumably have elected the first African-American woman into the vice presidency, uh, Kamala Harris. And so I'm curious what you all think about this first. Um, there's been a lot of attention paid to first as markers of history or change. And I, I'd love to hear what you think as historians about that. So Spencer, you, you want, want to start us off? <laughs> well, clearly it is a historic moment. Uh, and I think it sort of marks a clear different way of seeing things for the moment. Um, I'm sort of waiting and marking time. Um, we had a moment previously where we had an African-American president and we thought that might portend something really different. Uh, and it didn't always work out the way we expected. So I'm optimistic and hopeful, but I tend to be very uh, careful about making pronouncements early on in the conversation. I think she's gonna be, uh, do a great job. I just hope she's allowed to do a great job. I think I would add to that, that uh, as a historian, I'm Clay. always- as a historian, I'm always skeptical about uh, the future of American history. Uh, it, there's a lot of pessimism that is built up from the past. And I, I, I would agree with, with Spencer that um, the, the optimism that we sometimes have after uh, historic events like the election of Barack Obama uh, sometimes doesn't uh, match the, the realism that uh, 70 million people looked at the administration of um, Donald Trump and decided we want four more years of that. Right. And uh, I, th I think that that sends us a message that, uh, that this uh, uh, divide that's in the country is not over, just as the Civil War uh, didn't get over. You know, it, it, uh, the South lost, but it ultimately it won the, the battles that came after that. So, uh, so I think that we need to be very careful about over optimism, but look, there could have been worse. The sun came out this morning and, and that, that was nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my partner told me I would have been devastated had it gone the other way. So I should be elated that it turned out the way it did. I'm not sure I buy that, but that's an argument I've, I've, been, I've been given. What, what do you all think we should look for um, when we want to see if history is shifting, right? So if it's not first, which I think gets a lot of attention, right? The first African-American president, the first this, the first that. If it's not that, what should we look for we wanna, when we want to see if history is turning? Well, I, 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 I think that what we should be looking for is there's a deep-seated racial divide in, in America. And we kind of think that it can go away and uh, that one election can, can turn it. But I think we should remember, just, just imagine that black people didn't get the right to vote uh, even with the uh, Civil Rights uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965. And that all, only white Americans could vote in our elections. At that, we would only have conservative presidents. You know, in every election, white America has chosen the more conservative candidate. So the result of the exclusion of black Americans from the political process would have been 14 straight elections in which one party would win, which would mean that the other party would have to make, make itself like the Republican party. Mm -hmm. And because they changed in order to take advantage of that, 
that reality in American politics. Every single election, white Americans have chosen the more conservative candidate. And you know, it's only the change in demographics right, right. of the electorate that has made, made the difference. So, uh, so I think that that's, that's the problem. It's not, it's not this external problem of you know, all, all the different candidates. It doesn't matter what the candidate is. The problem is that we have that, that basic desire of Americans, white Americans, to say, we want more of the same. We want, we want what we've been used to. And until that reality is dealt with, I don't think we're gonna change as a nation. Yeah. I would agree with that. Um, I think the other component I would add to that is uh, there is control and power in their hands. And I think what we have to see is that begun to get wrestled away from them. Because uh, what we're, I think the conservatism is, conservatism is, as Clay has said, they want to conserve the way things were, because the way things were favored them. So uh, things won't change until we can begin to shift that power equation. And I think the demographics is an important uh, pathway to that. Um, I had hoped that that would have more impact a lot, a lot sooner than it hasn't. So I think what we're going to have to watch for is how that demographic shift begins to affect policies and begins to affect how um, um, the balance of power comes to fruition in, in the country. Um, I have to say I was uh, hopeful a bit with uh, Biden's uh, speech on Saturday when he recognized that uh, African-Americans and black women were the ones that got him over the top. Now the key is, will he remember that? Will that be uh, reflected in his policies? And is that something we can sustain for the long haul as opposed to a, 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 a short moment in time? Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned the voting um, habits of white folks in this country and, and without a shift in the demographics, we wouldn't really have a shift in the policies, right? We would have what we would consider conservative presidents um, all the way down, more or less. Um, but there has been a shift historically in the attitudes reported by um, white Americans. How do you how do you reconcile those two things, right? So there's been a shift in how people think and talk about race, um, but at the same time, when you look at the majority of whites, at least the way they vote, that that has hasn't shifted to the same extent. Like, how do you think about that as a historian, um, Spencer? You want to jump in there first? Uh, I, I like to look at the long view, and I think part of the long view is how sustained is that shift. Uh, I worry that uh, it is sort of the thing of the moment. And I, I am worried that um, the attention of individuals shift very quickly and can shift from one thing to another. And for me, the question is whether or not that's gonna be a sustained uh, perspective or will there be something else that comes along that gets people's attention and they wanna set aside uh, this issue of the moment. I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues at the Smithsonian who had her uh, staff make a presentation to some of her board members. And they were talking about social justice and about the need to do that. And the response they got back with, from them was, well, uh, we've done that for a while. Can we think about something else? Can we think about something more pleasant? And I think that's what you worry about is that there is sort of a sense of it is the right social thing to do for the moment, but is it something that people have really internalized and really truly have taken on as is the direction the country needs to go. I think it's much more basic than simply becoming more aware of the problems that um, Black Americans face. I think ultimately it comes down to um, what I, what I think is the, the essential problem is uh, white Americans need to understand that their interests coincides with the interests of black people. You know, we've had a, a, you know, it's been analyzed by political scientists. Why, why do poor whites vote, vote against their self-interest? Why do white Americans who go to their local county health center vote against Obamacare? You know, why, why do people who would benefit 
from coalition with progressive blacks turn away from it. You know, and, and that's that's what King was talking about at you know at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March. He talked about how many poor whites in the South feed their hungry kids the stale bread of racism. That no matter how poor you are, how much you could use, say, uh, the right to have uh, health care for your children, you reject it in favor of racial privilege. You know, we, we might be poor, but we're white. And as long as that suffices, you know, we, we've got a problem in this country. You know, when I look at, at that uh, 70 million Americans who, who voted for Trump, yeah, some of them probably uh, actually believe Trump. <laughs> I don't know how, you know, I mean, he's a pathological liar. But I think what they do believe is that he represents the interests of white people. And that he, despite the fact that his main priority is to get more money in the hands of rich white people, but that's been a history in American politics. That that notion that this, that you can somehow gain from policies that are not designed for you, but designed to tap into your resentments. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're both pointing to is the importance of um, symbolism in terms of how people experience themselves and their position in the world as distinct from or separate from their material condition, right? Like if, if it's helping out, it's helping me terms my health care or in terms of my ability to feed my kids that's separate from how does it make me think about who I am in this, in this country, in this context, right? That symbolism. And so I wanna turn to that and, um, and talk a bit about uh, historic symbolism. So right now in Stanford, something um, recently came out from the president that we are gonna change the name of Jordan Hall and move the statue of uh, Louis Agassiz. So that is just one small thing that's happening around the country with the movement of Confederate monuments. And I'm curious how you all think about that as his historians, right? So we are, these are, they're part of our history. And a lot of people would say it that way. Why are we tearing down our history? Why are we moving our history? How should we think about what we're doing there, what we're doing at the university, what we're doing around the country right now. Spencer, do you want to take that? I, I'll certainly be glad to, to start with it. Um, I think it's a, a bit of a complicated conversation to a degree. Uh, my perspective is that uh, history is important to understand and to remember. The question is, how do you go about doing that? And do you take these statues that are in very public places where people are forced to confront them? Or do you create spaces where you can sort of uh, place them and create conversations and learning around them so that people can get that history, but they get it in a, in a space that's been set aside for doing that? Uh, I am worried and, and bothered by statues that are in spaces that are supported by public funds, where all those who are helping to um, provide resources for that, sometimes are, are, are bothered by what they see and are insulted by what they see. And we probably ought not have them in the courthouses and we shouldn't have them on public lands, but create maybe uh, parks where you can have them to tell that story and give them context and give people an option. To, so if they want to engage with them, they can, but it's not something they're forced to have to and confront in their daily lives. Um, so for me, it's finding that balance that the history is not lost because if we lose the history, we could have problems later on, but you don't want to force people to have to confront something that's painful for them uh, in, in, a, in a public space. So can I ask, let me follow up on that. Would you yeah. feel the same way about a statue of King? Should it not be in a public space? Well, I, but I think what's going on with King is you don't, for example, with Confederate uh, statues, 
Uh, you have people who have taken a uh, position of denigrating others and of uh, uh, classifying them as less than others. I think with King, you don't have that. I, I think there are people for whom the, you're trying to uplift humanity, you're trying to uplift our connections to one another and those who are looking at ways of creating classes of individuals that you can, as, as was said earlier, say, uh, no matter my condition, I'm better than that person. Those are the kind of things you don't, you don't want to have to force people to have to struggle with. Um, and why you want to have that story maintained because um, I don't believe history repeats itself. But as one uh, scholar said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And I think it's important to keep that in mind and keep that in, in, um, in our mindsets so we don't let that go by the wayside and, uh, and, and lose what it can provide for us in terms of understanding uh, the evolution of our society. I'm not surprised. Oh, I'm been... follow up and go, go ahead, go ahead, Clay. I'm not surprised that, uh, that someone who works with the Museum to Preserve History would, would favor <laughs> preserving history. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that we would agree that, you know, I, I don't see protests out there to re remove the Jefferson Memorial or the Lincoln Memorial, despite his statement that, you know, if he would uh, prioritize saving the Union over uh, ending slavery. You know, I, I think that that would be, to me, um, you know, kind of misunderstanding what is going on. Uh, I think most people who favor removing statues are looking at the motivation that led to the statue in the first place. Now, these statues, Civil War statues, were not created, uh, most of them were not created after the Civil War. They were created at a time when Jim Crow was being implemented in the South. You know, the, a lot of these uh, efforts to uh, create these memorials were specifically designed to say, you may think that things have changed since the Civil War, but we're here to remind you that things haven't changed. And so it was that motivation. You know, when I, I remember taking my students to uh, uh, Selma, you know, part of a, we've, I've taken a number of groups through the South to retrace the, the civil rights struggle. And I would have done that in June, but something happened in between. Uh, the, the, uh, we got to Selma and we went over at the suggestion of a local activist uh, to the, the cemetery. And there was a memorial to Nathan Bedford Forrest at his grave site. And there was, it was surrounded by the Confederate flags. It was the largest gravesite in the whole uh, cemetery of Selma, Alabama. And, uh, you know, so I, I took them there and they looked at it and, and I asked them, I said, when was this, when do you think this statue was built? And they, you know, guessed a number of things and they said, 2001. Yeah, what, what was that all about? Why did people in Selma want to create in 2001 a memorial to a Confederate general who was guilty of war crimes, who was among the founders of the KKK? And what does that represent? What message is that sending to your fellow citizens of Selma? And why don't you care about that? That's the issue. It's not, it's not the question of whether we have memorials. I, I love memorials. I think that it's, it's uh, his, I, I love history. I, I want to know the good and the bad of history. Uh, but, it's, it, but you have to think about why are you doing this? What is the purpose? And, and, and I think as Spencer knows, you know, that's, that's a central issue for museums itself. Yeah, part of the reason why we have museums is that the imperialist countries of Europe wanted to bring back their loot in order to show off that they now are the 
people who run the world. And, you know, so that, what is the motivation is important. So I'm happy you brought that up. I wanted to ask about that. So it's an interesting position to have the motivation for why something was installed should dictate how we respond to it now, right? Because it's about either it's either about the narrative or an understanding of that motivation for the current people, right? So if I'm right now, I'm in Selma and they are erecting this, this memorial and understand what it's about, that's a, a direct assault to me. A hundred years from now, they might have erected that, that memorial for the same reason, but I'm more removed from it. In that case, does it still matter why they did it? Like, it's just an interesting thing. I'm curious about how you think about the motivation for the memorials and the, the meaning of it in the current time. Do you separate them or no? I think you have to look at the motivation and, and it's, it's always, you know, that applies a lot of, to a lot of things. It applies to why people voted for Trump. Yeah, you know, on the one hand, I would say, you know, this is this is a democracy. People have a right to vote for whomever they want. And if they like uh, Trump's fiscal policy better than Biden's fiscal policy, who am I to say? I might say they're wrong, but that's not that's not the purpose of a democracy. But if they're voting for him because he represents something that is threatening to me, then that is, some, that is a matter of concern. I, I'd agree, I think the motivation is important. And I guess part of the reason why um, I've spoken for not losing those statutes, for example, for, uh, forever, but maintaining that history is because the motivation behind them is an important marker. Uh, and it also helps to explain why people in a later time are resonating to it to such a degree because I think they also understand it represents something larger uh, than, than just the statue itself, but a statement about a, a, a period in time and how people saw others in that period of time. And they're trying, they're in some ways embracing that. Uh, and um, uh, sometimes clothing it in innocent words, but our understanding that the motivation is not so innocent and the, the implications are not as innocent as people want to pretend that they are. And what would you tell people who feel like their, their history or culture is being taken away from them? So, I mean, that is, that is the obvious argument, right? That's the argument that people make about preserving them, keeping them where they are. And, and I, I, I understand it's easy if the argument is they are doing that in a deliberate attempt to um, subordinate some other group or to demonstrate their supremacy, right? But presumably there's some number of people where that is not the primary motivation. They really do feel like it's a part of their heritage that's valuable and important to them. What would you tell those people? I, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I, I would say look, look closely at it. I mean, I, I think all of us recognize that we're, we're the survivors from the past. We're the, we're the ones, I'm living in Palo Alto. You know, I, I understand that uh, I'm probably living on the tops of the graves of the Ohlone uh, people who no longer exist as a people. You know, so look, all of us are the people who have survived the past. The rest, the rest are gone. And there have been lots of genocides in history. So, so yeah, we need to, I would hope that I would be self-conscious. And, and at Stanford, that is one of the discussions that is going on of whether to name a dorm after one of the colonizers who wiped out the native people here. You know, these, these are discussions that need to happen. And I am, I would hope that if one of the oppressors were, was a black man, that I would understand that conversation. Uh, on, on, uh, we have not had a, a lot of opportunities to be the oppressors in the world. But uh, if one of those accidents of history happened, you know, I, I would hope that I would, I would be able to understand the sensitivities of the people who got wiped out. But I think it's also important to have a full picture of that culture, a full picture of that individual, 
That's very often what we tend to do is to highlight what we think are the heroic aspects of that individual and to elevate them to a level of almost uh, worship. And I, I think it's important if you're going to think about that culture, that individual, that you think about the full picture and understand all the implications that go with it as opposed to creating these sort of sometimes mythical um, uh, stories that go with them that, that don't look at them as real people with shortcomings. Uh, I, I think it is true that all of us have shortcomings uh, and it's important that those are all made plain so that as if one is talking about preserving their, their history, their culture, they need to be thinking about the full um, array of things connected with that as opposed to taking slices of it and elevating that as the thing to be remembered. I think that's what um, we're trying to make sure is the case is that you understand the full array of issues, traits connected with that as opposed to looking at one piece of it and deciding that that's all you need to know about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to me that people often learn about artifacts, right? So we're talking about kind of artifacts of history, what's been produced and memorialize it. They often learn about those things without context, right? So one of my students that um, told me when we were preparing for this, that she learned some songs that were sung by slaves, but didn't know the context in which they were sung. Like she had, in school, she and her classmates learned them and they didn't really tell them much about the context. And they, they thought they were happy songs, right? They didn't know where they were from. And so as we think of these things that right now, it sounds like we're talking a lot about artifacts, but really it seems to me what we're talking about are the narratives around those artifacts. Like what do they mean? How do, they, how do we experience them? What do they tell us about ourselves? And so I guess the question for me, and this is not about the, the symbols, but what, what or who rather gets to create the narrative around those symbols. So right, what you all are, are talking about is some objective reality around what they mean. But I could, I could argue that there's only the construction around what they mean, the narratives put around them. And then there's a question about who gets to create that narrative. So it could be that what's really happening is that people are upset, but not about the statue, but about the idea that somebody else is getting to create the narrative around those statues. And so why should, or who should get to create that narrative? What, what, who should get to tell the story? decide what story gets told. My, my feeling oh, is, should, should, there be a, should, should there be a single narrative? Um, in, in my business in the museum, what we talk about with artifacts is their provenance. And what is it about that object that makes it important? And what we've always argued to a, a great degree is, so what moment in time in existence of that object are you highlighting? And our, in talking about provenance, are you deciding that because it was associated with someone of notoriety, that that's what makes it important? Or is there another aspect in its life when it is also important to someone who's not as, a, uh, as noteworthy, but it's still an important aspect of what it stands for? A, a great example of it in our uh, building uh, uh, is there is a, um, a rock in one of our exhibits that had been located in a town uh, nearby Fredericksburg that had been celebrated for years and years there because Andrew Jackson had given a speech standing on that rock. Well, that's one thing you can think about. Well, the other issue with that is that it actually turned out to be a slave block and that uh, lots of families were broken apart and sold on that same block. So what's its provenance? What is the history that you want to highlight with it? Or do you have to really share a much more complex story that goes with this. And I think for me, that's the challenge is that we tend to try to avoid complexity and try to simplify our sense of things. And it's the complexity of them that is important for us to have to grapple with. I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's, that's the business of historians and um, you know, people who work in museums. You know, the, trying to tell a story. It's not, in any object doesn't have meaning. Well, it does have meaning in itself, but sure. we want context. We want to know why is this important for us to know? And, and I think that one of the things that has been 
um, part of the changes that have gone on in the United States. I, I don't want to give a lot of credit to historians because I, you know, a lot of that, we're not, we don't write bestsellers typically, but I think that there has been a shift in terms of an understanding of American history. I mean, just, just the notion that Martin Luther King is a national holiday. That is a that is a shift, and that uh, Columbus Day is going going away gradually. Right. right. Uh, so you know these these are things. These no holiday has existed forever. It had to come into existence because uh, people felt that it was it was necessary. And uh, you know if you look at something like late um, May Day. <laughs> You know, May Day meant quite different things to workers in the 1880s than it does today, which is kind of being ignored. You know, once it was the workers' holiday of the world, but then it got associated with you know, uh, socialist nations <laughs> celebrating May Day, and then, then it became very unpopular to see it as a labor holiday. So these things change over time. And it, it's... Uh, it's interesting that history does have an impact. I mean, one of the reasons why many of us became historians is because we read history books and we said, that's wrong. Right. You know, that's, that's not the right story. Somehow this guy got it right, wrong. Even though they might have won a Pulitzer Prize, they got it wrong. And uh, that becomes the motivation for you becoming a historian. So it's. Uh, it's it's a continuing process yes. and we we look at things through a different lenses as as time goes on i want to come I, back to that right I, or wrong by the way i want to come back to that but go ahead spencer i was just gonna say i agree entirely that um i think too often people see history as facts that are uh fixed and once you have that fact that's how it is and i think what we understand in our own work is that uh, those things change. And a natural part of the process is gaining new information, new perspectives, and allowing that to continue to blossom and, and to have great, greater richness to it. Uh, and um, I think that's what keeps us as historians excited and involved, but it's something we have a harder time translating to the larger public. You still have individuals who believe that there is one set of facts and those are the facts forever. Uh, and our, our, our task is to help them understand that that's not in fact the case. And what makes history interesting is it's constant revelations that we can uh, um, gain through our work and through our research. I give you all a lot of credit. And I also, in some part, <laughs> give you our responsibility for someone like Trump. So let me, let me break, break that down. So I think that, um, it is true there's been a shift in how, how people have thought about the past, just in, at least in this country. And, um, and you could argue that part of what's happening with Trump, and there's obviously many arguments about what happened there, but um, it's a counter reaction to the shifts that were taking place, right? That people were unhappy with the changing narrative about what this country is and should be, and that people were um, responding to that, that people are responding to that. And you get things like a pushback against removing statues that were certainly put up long after the Civil War as a, a part of the retrenchment of white superiority. You get things like voting for um, someone who you know takes children away from immigrants um, in this country. And I guess you could argue that is in part a reflection of the power of a shifting narrative but what I wanted to ask you about that is how do you how do you respond to the that um, that reactionary response? What do you do about that reactionary response as historians? Clay, you want to go first? I don't want to let him go first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think one of the things that that I would suggest is that we try to understand the 70 million people who voted for Trump. I mean, I, I grew up in a small town. It was a very special small town. It was Los Alamos, New Mexico. But I, I kind of understand 
life outside places like Palo Alto where I live now. And I understand that there are different perspectives about what this nation represents. And I think that we, we need to understand particularly, you know, and this is the, to me the, the central political question of our era. Why do people vote against their economic interests? What, what do they get in compensation for that? And political scientists have tried to understand that, historians have tried to understand that. Anyone involved in progressive movements knows that you, know, you can present a rational argument about how you would benefit from free healthcare. And the person will look you blankly in the face and say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't feel that I'm going to benefit from that. that. Or that there's something else that is more important to me than free health care. And you have to get drilled down and say, well, what is it that is more important to you? Is it a um, economic ideology? Maybe it is. Uh, my own guess is that it, it's, most people are not economists. They, they're, it's something more basic than that. It's not what, what, and that gets to that, what King was raising about the wages of whiteness. What, what benefits, what psychic benefits do you get? And we have to understand that. And I, and I think I understand something about those psychic benefits, uh, a sense of freedom, self-sufficiency, you know, a lot of values that are important. And, and I think that that's until we understand why it is that a president can essentially deliver for the super rich and be seen as a populist. And you know, that until we understand that, I don't think we're going to, I think we'll have more Trumps because they're, they're not uncommon in American history. And it's, it's, you know, that's something that I, you know, we have had you know, this, this period, you know, I, I've, I've studied a lot about the period after the Civil War, you know, uh, particularly in the late 19th century, the 1880s, 1890s, when workers in this country were very discontented. There was union movements, populist movements, the Populist Party. Uh, I, you know, one of the books that I, I read, uh, which I would recommend, um, to people um, was um, a book, uh, oh gosh, now I'm forgetting it, uh, but it, it was a book about socialism in America, basically. And um, it was, it came out as, as a novel, it was one of Coretta's favorite novels. Okay. Looking backwards, uh, Susan, my <laughs> wife, who has better remember than <laughs> Whispered in my ear, I wish she was always here. Uh, and, uh, looking backward. And I would recommend people who are not familiar with the book, take a look at it because it was one of the best selling books, probably the third best selling novel of the 19th century. And it was a book foreshadowing, you know, talking about a person waking up in the 21st century and the nation is socialist. And it was read by millions of people. You had Bellamy clubs. Bellamy, Bellamy right. was the writer of it. And what happened to that? How, how did that become the rise of the Jim Crow era? Why did we not have a strong labor movement like in Europe, which led to 
you know, uh, universal medical care, which led to so many of the, the kinds of reforms that happened there, but not here. And a lot of that was that at a certain point, it became easier for people to put their faith in um, policies that benefited the rich, uh, that ignored the problems of poor white Americans. And, and I think you know, that period really set us on this present course. Why did, why did the South resurrect a Jim Crow system? You know, there, there, there was other options that were open then. <laughs> uh, and, and the Populist Party was one of those options. Uh, why did it get grounded in, in racial conflict? You know, so, so I think until we can kind of understand the missed possibilities of American history, we're not going to, we might miss this possibility. I, I would agree. What I would uh, also want to put into the mix is, I also think that, um, I don't hit, believe history is cynic, uh, cyclical, but I think there are ebbs and flows. And the country we were in the 1890s, is, we're different from that. The country we were in the 1930s, we're different from that. It's not cataclysmic change, but you watch shifting taking place. Um, and we're different now than we were in the 1960s. I mean, uh, as Clay well knows, when King was out there uh, marching, the majority of the country just thought he was doing a terrible thing. Now he's seen it in a different kind of light. So part of it is, I think, small shifts uh, and small, I don't know if it's revelations or, or, or feelings that maybe there is some benefit to seeing things slightly different that happen in small ways. But it, uh, I think it's always a back and forth. And we're in a sort of a back and forth moment now as well, where there's some shifting back towards a, a different way. And we're hoping that maybe we're gonna shift forward. I don't think it's to uh, you know, a, a, a major change in our country, but maybe small changes that we hope will stick and that back and forth will continue to move us forward um, to, to maybe slight improvements over time. Let me, let me um, try to um, respond to Clay and, and, and think about a Trump voter in a sympathetic way. Right? So when we think about history, I'm gonna get the roundabout way, but I'm gonna pay uh, respect to both your professions as historians. So when we think about history, often we talk about it as making sense of the past and other people's history, but I'm, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit differently. So history really is a reading of ourselves. So history as making sense of the world we live in and in that way, placing or locating ourselves in a particular way, right? So what does it mean for me um, to be a black man in this country given the history of black folks in this country, right? So when I read history, I learn something about how to make sense of my own experience, who I am, what makes me worthy, et cetera. When you think about the history that we're trying to present for Trump voters, like where does that leave them, right? What, if they accept the history that you are presenting, right? What, where's their sense of worth come from? Like when they see, when they think about, here's where I am, I'm either I'm doing well or I'm not doing well. And when you think about race in this country, how do I understand my place now? Right? What does it mean to have succeeded in a world that is, white, that is driven by white supremacy? What does it mean to have failed in a world driven by white supremacy? So I, I think that when we talk about history, we also often talk about it again as if something that happened out there in the past. But really, you could also think about it as a way of thinking about ourselves in the present. And when you go back and ask, you could ask a white, a white American, how does this make you feel? Like, what do you do? How do you understand your experience in this country as a white person? You could argue there's not, a, there's a, a negative response to that. And that people are just rejecting that narrative because it doesn't feel good, right? And they're willing to pay a price to reject that narrative because it's self-protected. Does that resonate? Can, if that is, and if it does, what would you tell that person? Play. I think one of the, one of the things that I would want to 
put into my understanding of the 70 million who voted for Trump is we live in a precarious world. Everybody, uh, maybe not the super rich, but you know, everybody else <laughs> uh, is living in a precarious world where things can go badly. And, and the pandemic has reinforced that notion. Um, but, but we, you know, we've grown up knowing that the world could end in a nu nuclear holocaust. You know, not the, the kind of fear that I had growing up, but you know, uh, the climate crisis, you know, all of these sorts of things. And I think that makes people super not cautious always. But, but certainly concerned about their own self-interest, you know, and and I think that you know, we we people who live in places like Palo Alto or the the affluent parts of the nation, you know, when I look at that map of the Trump vote, the Biden vote, it's a map of different kinds of of, of life, you know, and we, we sometimes forget that the Biden people are the winners, not the losers. You know, the, the life here in, in Palo Alto, we might worry about fires, but we're not worried about our next paycheck. We're not worried about health care. We're not worried about a lot of things that people in other places in the country are worried about. And, and we are protective of that privilege. You know, all you have to do is look at what happens when someone comes in with a proposal to put low-income housing in the middle of a suburb, in the middle of Palo Alto, and you find, oh, I don't want it in my neighborhood. And you know, so those kinds of protective attitudes exist even among those who I would consider the winners in, the, in this world contest. People want to move here from all over the world. But you still have that sense of, I need to protect what's mine. And that should allow us to have some empathy for that 70 million people. Uh, you know, I look, it's hard to have empathy for people who I, I think sometimes vote for racist reasons. Right, right. But I can kind of understand why they felt left out. I mean, when they turn on the television, black people are Obama, LeBron James, uh, you know, all the entertainment celebrities you know that they're, they're they don't feel sorry for them but that's that's the image and then the other side of the image of course are the, the people who are looting stores and you know that sort exactly, of thing exactly yeah yeah but, but i but i think that the notion of empathy works both ways right there we, we have to have some empathy for those who live precarious lives, lives and why they want some security. And I think the Democratic Party has to offer them that. And, and I think that at the center of, of the Democratic Party is a notion that, yeah, the, we want to offer them that. We, we understand this problem of voting against your economic interests. We want to show that we can deal with your economic interests and take some of that precarious nature of your life out of it so that you can not worry about drowning in debt, so that you can not worry about having a health care bill that you can't pay, so that you can have some sense that <laughs> there we go. Well, we're, not, 
Oh, we're not recording anymore. None of what we see from this right. point on is going to be historical. <laughs> That's right. There'll be no record for it. Okay. Well, I, I was saying, uh, Clay, I, I, I agree very strongly with what you were saying. Uh, and it struck me over the weekend as you listen to, um, especially Biden beginning to speak. That's what he's trying to speak to, trying to find a, a places of connection between groups that have been at odds and trying to find um, ways of addressing those issues. Um, the hope is that people are willing to listen. People are willing to see that there may be ways in which you don't disagree agree on everything, but there are places where there are connections that can work to help people feel more part of what's going on, to feel, uh, their issues are being thought about uh, as, as policies are being created. Um, I, I'm hopeful for that. Um, and um, as I said earlier on, I'm sort of in a, I need to wait and see how this unfolds. I'm probably a little bit more pessimistic than you are about others uh, coming to recognize that and um, instead the resentment um, being so strong that they can't get past that but I'm hopeful that maybe that can happen. It, here's, it seems to me that maybe the Democrats are um, confused about what the uh, 70 million people that voted for Trump want, right? They're like, how, there are a lot of liberals that are like, look at these people voting against their self-interest. And I, I'd agree with Clay, a lot of those people are, the winners are, comfor are comfortable. And maybe what those people want and maybe what they need and, and maybe a reasonable thing to ask for is a narrative that allows them a sense of self-respect and self-worth, right? That maybe people are willing when, when they don't have that to pay for that in, in economic terms. They may not see it that way, but that's what their behavior suggests. And it, it's hard for the winners to understand that because we already, there's already, we already have that by virtue of being winners, right? That we don't have to make a trade-off between the material and a narrative of self-worth for many people. And so it, if that's true, like what, what narrative would you give as your historians, you create narratives, like what narrative would you give those voters, right? So they can feel a part of what's going on, not just policies that give them material things, but a narrative that lets them feel like they are a positive addition to what this country can be and, and from your perspective should be. And so do you want to try that? Oh, sure, I'll give it a try. Um, I'm trying to think about what you say as a narrative. Um, I, I guess in my own mind's eye, what I'm thinking about is um, ways of getting people to understand the commonality of their existence here. And in that commonality to find places where working collaboratively can work to the benefit of all those who are involved in that um, endeavor. And um, by showing examples of where, when those collaborations happen, that you can see forward motion, you can see a, a benefit to um, more people and, and more of those individuals as a consequence of those choices. Uh, so I guess my narrative would be one of understanding that commonality and how those collaborations can allow a wider variety of people to feel valued and to feel contributors and feel a part of um, the history and the growth and the future of the nation. One thing that I thought during the Obama era is that he should have traveled more uh, into middle America. And I realized that one of the things that constrained him was the fear of being assassinated. Uh, that, uh, but, you know, what, what if an American president, and Biden would probably be more able than Obama to do this, uh, shows up at the county fair in Mississippi, you know, or you know, just has a conversation at the, at the local diner 
in, in Tennessee, in a small town in Tennessee, and just talks to people. I think just sometimes the symbolic effort to do that would be a, an important step. Because I, I think that as much as many people in many parts of the country, you know, one of the things that when a, a, a white person wants to show that they're on the right side, I voted for Obama, you know, and, um, and I think that that happened more than we imagine in middle America. You know, there were places and we've seen these analyses of, of places in, in middle America that turned toward Obama and voted him in for two terms. Mm -hmm. now, how did that same electorate turn right. around? And uh, I can't think of more a more distinct personality from Obama than Donald Trump. Right. But what it might have sensed is that even during the Obama era, there was a sense, which I don't know we can argue about whether it was right or wrong, that certain parts of America were being ignored. That Obama was this, you know, it was a black celebrity and had, you know, a very well-educated black person. But his experience as someone growing up in Hawaii and, you know, all of that sort of stuff had nothing to do with American reality, and to some extent, when we look at his biography, you're probably right. I mean, he, he's a he's a product of a very distinct, exotic aspect of America, and and I think that somehow connecting him to the kind of place that uh, is voting eighty percent Trump, now, you might not have brought that down to 50% Trump, but you might've brought it down to 60% Trump. <laughs> and that's, that's a game. And, you know, that, and maybe we need that kind of dialogue going on. And one of the most hopeful things about the Black Lives Matter is that it happened in small towns. Yes. Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't just the cities. It, it, it happened in Utah, it happened in small towns in, in the Midwest. Uh, they had their own, you know, and, and that was important for people to see. You know, I, I saw Black Lives Matter protests where there was hardly a black man there or a black woman there. So, so something is happening and, and it's not just limited to the big cities and the the, the coast and it, it's also happening in Trump America. And, and, and that's gonna become more because you know, quite frankly, a lot of the people from Trump America are my students at Stanford and the people who work for me here. And, you know, that because, and they're leaving small town America because they don't feel comfortable there. And coming to the cities. And, you know, there is a reverse movement. I mean, I, I have students who have also gone to Tulsa because they can actually get a grant to come there right? <laughs> because they want to bring in some, some uh, highly educated uh, young people. And uh, maybe that kind of movement would be, would be really great to have so that, uh, so that they would be able to see at their local diner that this person from uh, San Francisco, not really a bad guy. You know, they, they like, and, and plus that in small town America, you have your Starbucks. So uh, you know, it, it's, we, we have a lot in common. Yeah. And things are changing. Yeah, so I, we're basically at time, but I want to give you just each a, a minute or so to answer one last question, which is, we have uh, a lot of um, Stanford uh, business school students uh, on the line and other leaders in the business community. What would you want to leave them with? 
So given all we've discussed, what would be the final thing you'd want to leave the audience with? I'll let you go first, Spencer. Me? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, I'd like to leave them with thinking about the growth of this country, thinking about the changes we've seen, I would think even since the 1960s and the benefits it has brought to a wider expanse of people, um, how important it is, basically how important it is to embrace the diversity that we stand for, that we are as a nation, to, to see it as, I think as Clay has said, something that can benefit them and benefit the nation uh, internally, but also externally as we navigate the larger part of the world. Uh, and, and that uh, if we take advantage of the people resources we have and the possibilities there, that uh, what history will help us understand is that that can help us grow and become stronger as a nation. And I think um, work in a much more efficient and useful way. I, I think that um, when I think of my Stanford students and I want them to and understand that there's a certain amount of privilege they have received. Uh, that going here and succeeding at, at a place like Stanford is going to set you on a course where you're not going to face the uh, precarious um, nature of the world that most people in the world face. And, and I, I know that it's very easy to get into that inside that bubble where it just doesn't matter out there. Where you know, there are, yeah, lots of people who are suffering in the world. And uh, you know, sometimes we can forget that. And, and I think that remembering that and making yourself aware of it is probably the, the hardest thing to learn at a place like Stanford. <laughs> I, I think of Stanford, uh, you know, I, I went to, to UCLA and I worked my way through school. So I, when, I, when I came here, I said, this is, this is a playground. <laughs> and, you know, if I had had a scholarship to Stanford and, and come to a place like this, it would have been like, yeah, I've got four years of being on a playground, or maybe even more years. And, and but that's not the root. I, I would hope that I would remember what the real world was. When, you know, as I said, I, I, I worked my way through school. I never had any scholarship or any other kinds of things of just getting so for me, I was quite aware that my first responsibility was to pay my rent. <laughs> and, and that's the first responsibility of a good part of humanity, a good part of Ameri American society, is just to pay the rent or the mortgage or whatever it keeps you, keeps you going. Mm -hmm. And so I would just say, don't lose touch with that. Don't lose touch with that. You know, if you came from that, go back to it and remind yourself of it. If you didn't come from that, go out and learn something about it. <laughs> that, well, I, that is going to Well, I, that's a great, that's a great message to end on. I, I really um, appreciate both your time. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to me. It was great. I really appreciate it. Um, so next week, we'll continue our exploration of narratives and we'll talk to Dana Kennedy the VP and publisher at Simon & Schuster, one of the um, big five publishing houses. And if you like this program, please share our podcast with your friends. You can find it wherever your podcast or wherever you download your podcast. Um, this is Leadership for Society, Race and Power. Thanks again, um, Clay and Spencer, it was great.
Thank you so much.